Okay, welcome everybody to Reverb Future Proofing TNT Music Part 3. Um, this week we have some really great guests with us. Um, we're going to just be bringing them in one by one. Uh, so let's start off. We're going to go with ladies first. So first we have Ms. Giselle Langton. She's a creative producer, stage manager, and director. She's produced many theatrical film and television productions. She's also a brilliant stage, stage and production manager and is currently the unit coordinator for stage department at the Lord Kitchener Auditorium at Napa. So let's add Giselle. Hello. Hey, Giselle, how are you? I'm good. Still alive. Good, good, good. Okay, and next we're going to bring in Mr. Jessel Murray, who is a senior lecturer in the music department at the University of West Indies. He's also the deputy dean for distance and outreach at the Faculty of Humanities and Education. And he's also the chair of the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festivals Association. Good day, Mr. Murray. How are you? All right. Hi. And you can call me Jessel. I, I want to <laughs> next time we calling her Miss Langton and Dame Langton oh, and all kinds of things. Okay. <laughs> right. So, and um, finally, Mr. Arnold, John Arnold, will be joining us um, in about 50 minutes. So we could actually get started on the discussion. So, um, Maybe uh, we could start with you, Giselle. Give us a slight background. Um, besides what I already mentioned, I mean, I know you from when I worked with you during Proscenium Productions. I don't know if you remember that. Well, I think we you work with Proscenium. That's that's uh, Andrew. Yes. Andrew. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Yeah, super yeah. sad, Andrew. Super sad. Yeah, Andrew, super yeah. sad. Yeah. So yeah. It, was, okay. it was really fun days working in. Um, I think it was Queens all back in those days doing all yep. these different musical theater pieces. That was really, really great. So we yeah, just on getting rent. I remember that because I, I worked on that um, part of the music, and that was quite groundbreaking and uh, um, supposedly risk taking at the at the. Yes. Time. But everybody yeah. came out for that. It was a, it was a risk well worth taking. Not so just I because you were there. Yes, I was very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I've been I've been involved in in I was going to say theater, but the entertainment mm -hmm. for ever, ever, ever from like um forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've done everything. I've even been on stage, which I don't like. But mm -hmm. I needed to do that just to get an experience of what it feels like and what it is. But I mainly deal with behind the scenes, um, getting things together and organizing and stuff like that. Um, because that's what I like. I like it because it's control. And I like that. Um, and I've seen stuff change, which for me is a big thing from the 80s to now. A lot has changed. People have changed. Um, situations have changed. And in the past year, even more now, um, which is now a challenge, a different challenge completely for everybody involved. Um, so I think for me, my experience brings a lot to what I do. Um, yeah, and that's kind of it. As we get into more, I'll, you know, I'll give you more information, but that's it for yeah. now. Sure. Okay. And Jessel, maybe you could give us just a, a quick background because I know your extensive experience <laughs> well yeah and i've and i've worked many times with giselle um, yes. in all sorts of capacities happily so um i i think well you you got most of it there of course i am a, i am a i'm a musician and, and within mm -hmm. music i, I um, i'm a pianist and i'm a conductor but i also teach voice as well at the university of west indies i do the arts chorale i co conduct the steel and I, um, I was thrown into, um, because of, us, of the untimely death of one of our faculty members, um, into um, co-directing our wind Sam. Um, where Giselle and I have intersected is over our, two of my major sets of pop productions. One as the first, the founding director of the Trinidad and Tobago National Steel Symphony Orchestra. And of course, we, we made a home at, the, at Napa. And so I did that for, for close to a decade. And then she also would know me, although I don't think she's worked directly on it, but I think she's attended under um, the production company, which um, four alumni of the University of the West Indies and I founded, which is the Must Come See production, which mm -hmm. comes up with the Movie Arts Chorale. And we have done um, extensive musicals starting in 2005. The last one was in 2007. Um, then full, full length musicals as well. And then of course you mentioned that my, my latest assignment and continuing assignment is as the chair 
of the executive committee of the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival, which of right. course is based in, in Queens Hall. And I do other things academically as well and so forth. But you know, that that's a, a snapshot, you know, what what I do. Yes. Right, great. So we have this wealth of knowledge and experience. And um, what I really want to start with is um, the Trinidad and Tobago, and I guess the Caribbean landscape for music, music theater, and the more, yeah, the, the festival style type events is very unique. And you have a lot of challenges. I mean, I experienced some of them myself. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the challenges that we've been experiencing and these um, this format before COVID, because I know even before COVID there were challenges to kind of make these things profitable, um, even possibly exportable, you know? So um, maybe we can start with you, Jessel. What what uh, challenges have you faced kind of, like for example, the music festival, I mean. Right. All right, so with the Trinidad de Bingo Music Festival, um, I'm a product of that, happily so. That, what, that helped me. Competition is a, a good and healthy thing when it's um, well managed, um, when there are, I think, professionals who are doing adjudication. And happily, in this particular festival, that the aborted one of 2020, everything, I don't know why I'm saying aborted, everything in 2020 was aborted, right? From the, from the time you, you say March onwards, oh yes, I get what you mean. But by the way, I, I look at your RV, uh, RVRB, and I'm thinking you all need to change that name to from future proofing to present proofing, because we are right. never going to be in the future the way we are going. That's, and that's actually my thinking with the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival. Um, I've been stating over and over, we, we can't be dealing with post-COVID. We are dealing with COVID for as long as we know, because COVID started in 2019. We are in 2021, past the first quarter, and look where we are. We're still dealing with 2019. But the festival itself, um, the Venerable Trinidad, and I have to call it the Venerable Trinidad Tobago Music Festival, it's 33 installments that we have done um, over the, and biannually. So, you know, that, that's a hefty amount of time. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I, I know the days when you could turn on the radio and the television and Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival was live. It was the mm -hmm. thing. The parallels of that would be with Trinidad and Tobago cricket, not even West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago cricket, which was live. And of course, how have things changed now? We have had to become in cricket, and I'm a cricket fan. Cricket has had to move from my favorite test match cricket over five days, which is not, you know, nowadays, can't, it, it, it can't entertain people for as long as the 2020, which in three to four hours, you have delivered what bang deliver. The same thing has happened with the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival. Um, before I've come on, what I'd seen historically that classes were added, added, and added. And, and yes, the training has been going on, the entertaining has been going on, but not the value of reaching into the general public. So our audiences and email participants, besides the juniors, have been getting older and older and are not being renewed. So even in 2020, before the COVID, we have to start thinking, what can we do to reposition the festival for 2020 and onwards? And we started that process by, um, at the adjudication level, by having all local adjudicators, really delighted. Some of my colleagues from the University of the West Indies were involved and others. We changed some of the classes. We started to cull some of the underperforming classes. You have to know that, of course, there's, there wasn't a hue and cry of, yes, Jessel, you're doing the right thing. No, <laughs> they're, they're oh, always see. vested interests. I'm not going to mention which classes, but there are people. And I said, no, this has to happen. And then how do we now position this for the digital age? COVID, the upside of COVID has been every one of us has had to become more efficient. As an academic, lots of the things which I should have been doing many years ago, down to delivering product online, adjudicating online, making things more streamlined, doing more visual um, uh, uh, type things to, to coordinate with talk. We've gone at the days of talk and chalk, um, sorry, chalk and talk. Now we, we have, we're online, we're supplementing with different types of videos. We have students interacting online. And this is the same thing for the Trinidad Tobago Music Festival. We have already started planning for festival 2022. And we have determined that in our, as I said, our present proofing is that it's going to be at least a hybrid experience where our preliminary and what we call our final rounds are going to be either live streamed or by video. 
And then perhaps we will have our final um, or our total championships from all the persons around Trinidad and Tobago will be face to face, but can be packaged digitally, either um, either live or can be packaged. And I have something sitting in my inbox already because the offers have started to come in of persons who have said, we can help you package and send this out and they have already given us, um, um, I have to say, it, um, so we are looking through the figures, the type of economic package, um, packages that will benefit us because the festival, you had mentioned it, Martin, that the festival itself has depended quite a lot on, on, on government at first. Now we have more private concerns where we are particularly indebted to First, um, First Citizens Bank for coming on board recently. And yeah, we have to become relevant. We've got to ensure that what we are doing is going to be reaching the persons, both the, the, the participants as well as the general public. And, and you mentioned it, and the last thing I'll say, because I know Giselle is going to be coming on, we have we are able to contemplate, not perhaps the 2022, but people from up the islands who are going to be coming, who are going to become participants at Broadens Our Pool and also hopefully to become consumers because we believe that we have a viable product and you mentioned it yourself trinidad and tobago in particular we have a wealth of unique festivals that mm -hmm. just need packaging need disbursement need monetizing so that's right. what you're about here so that's that's my total response right right well okay that i mean that gets a lot of points there and i mean this kind of brings it to giselle too so this whole um, I mean, you've been running Napa since about 2012, I believe. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure you would have seen um, the success and failure of different events being the kind of coordinator of there. And I know it's a tough venue to fill. It's 1,200 seats or something like yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, to fill 1,200 seats in before COVID with all of these different festivals with the fact that um, I would say the public is not the most, uh, doesn't have the largest buy-in to a theater experience in Trinidad, mm. you know? Um, what challenges would you have seen, you know, whether it's trying to fill seats or is it marketing before COVID and possibly yet yeah, during this whole time as well? Well, the thing is, um I will just, we'll just take like the trend on Tobago. Creativity is never an issue. Mm -hmm. we, we have a high level of that. Everybody has some talent. Finances is always an issue. Um, mm -hmm. For producers, being able to just get into a venue, you know, to have that. By the time you you have a dream of doing an event and you you get you rehearse, you you get everything together, and then now you have to pay the rent. You have to pay for different things. And by the time you get to the venue, you either your finances are either low or nil. Sure. And so now another level of creativity has to step in because now you have to think of how can I now get to the end of this dream? Um, and hopefully in, in that traveling into that dream, you the marketing is important because you can have a dream, but people have to come. And how do you get that? Because we, we're very fickle. Um, we would tell each other, hey, I see you're doing a show. Um, give me a comp now, I'll support you. Give me a comp is not support, <laughs> right? Because you have expenses. Mm. Please buy a ticket, that is supporting. Mm. Um, so producers have it hard. Some producers, it just remains a dream and it never comes to any fruition. Some, you know, they get through it and they, they get to the end and they, they, they get it on stage and you hope and you pray that an audience comes. Back in the day, like in the 80s, when you could rent a venue and you were able to have a five-day run. Sometimes you had a two-week run, which could help to get you, you know, out of the red. Um, now, producers are not even thinking of running for that long. I'm not sure why that has changed. Um, it changed over time. Like some of it had to do with the venues not being available, um, but but for somebody to be able to afford a two week rental, that is a lot. So so you have to line up all the ducks and make sure. Okay, if I pay for a rental for two weeks for a venue, can I make this back, or can I just even break even? 
am I giving out something that some people want to see? I mean, that's the first thing as well. Are you going to do an event that will bring in people or is it just, this is my dream, I'm putting it on, I don't care what, and people come, they come. In 2021, we really, you can't think that way anymore um, because it's just, it doesn't make sense financially or any other sense. Um, so sometimes it's a training of the audience as well. Training right. audiences to understand that this is a level of, of entertainment that you should um, support and understand that ticket prices have to be whatever they have to be because at the end of the day, we have to balance between business and show. Right. And no producer is going to go into it just because, hey, why not? It's You want to make some money. You want to be able to, if you have can have a career as a producer, to be able to do that. So that in, in the venues um, at Napa, you see, sometimes you see theatrical things happening, but corporate is also there as well, which helps to keep the venue up and running because you don't see enough theatrical stuff happening that can keep any venue in Trinidad running completely on just that. Because like I said, it's not like Broadway where you can run a production for 1700 performances straight. Hmm. That's not our society. We un fortunately or unfortunately, we're not there. If we can get there, I guess would be a great experience for us as a people. But um, at this point in time, the struggle is real. Some people are able to, to get over it. Some people um, try and hope and pray. And some people, unfortunately, just still dream and wish that maybe somebody could, a fairy godfather or somebody could just come along and say, hey, I know what you do. I like what you do. And here's a check. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, <laughs> just can say no. No, I yeah, I you speaking the language. I mean, my other hat, as as you would know, I did must come see productions, and mm -hmm. there was one time from two thousand and five we did a musical every year, mm -hmm. and I the figures are very clear to me because I just lectured on this to uh, one of my courses at UWE, finally a course in choral techniques and musicals as part of the arsenal, and I when I started to show them exactly what Giselle said. First of all, venue. Next. Broadway license. I showed them a license from 2006, where for five performances at that time, that's 4,000 US. That's your start. That's that's how many? That's 11 years. Sorry, no. Oh my gosh, that's 15 years ago. Yeah. So multiply that by three, <laughs> and then you add the venue, and then what Giselle is talking about to why people have had trouble is that, bless their souls, I love working at Queen's Hall um, for their theater. I, Napa, I love working for the, the larger scale events because of the space, but still. Mm -hmm. But at Queen's Hall, the first thing is that you're restricted because you can only log in, um, um, move in on a Monday morning at eight o'clock because there's something before. It takes you about three or four days to get your tech and your sets done and put in. So you, you can't just move in on Monday and expect to start on Tuesday. Mm. You're starting at best Thursday morning with a school show, and then you are packing it in, and then you have to be mindful of your actors because you can't expect your actors to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, two shows each. Mm. Now, I remember there was one production house who remained unnamed when I saw that they did three Broadway shows in one day. No union would ever allow that. And I saw that, and I, th and, and I know that the actors by the end were just hoarse. But no union, no actors union would allow that. But the people were desperate to recoup what they had done and they carried it on the on, on these, and I have to say amateur actors who were not paid much, who were not given much, stipended much. But professionals would have said, I'm sorry, that's triple over time. So that's the sort of thing that has happened. And I hope never to see that happening um, in the, um, again. Now there's another producer, again, was a, there's a bit of a scandal, who took the short route and decided I'm going to put on a very popular musical without a license. I'm going to cut the costs. And of course, they received a lawyer's letter at, at intermission and were told, cease and desist. That's not a way of doing business. But about the fairy godfather and the, the whole idea of cultivating persons, yeah, as an educator, as a person who has done education, this is a long-term project, which is to educate our students, send them out so they can educate their students 
to be cons besides performers to be consumers of of the art and it is a very difficult proposition i don't care whether it is, it is soca um whether it is well of course calypso which is of course in, in it has its own troubles whether it is um and then there's theater there is there's lovely ground baking gripping serious well let's say serious theater where you just you're gripped and of course we as a person's comedy is everything mm. All right. The only thing I would say to theater companies is if we could get a culture of a theater season where people buy a, a season ticket, where we can get one heavier drama and let's say call it two comedies and people say, yes, I'm buying all. But from a time, people know that they can't laugh all the way through because sometimes in some of these like the, the National Theater Arts Company, when, when, they, when, they, they, when they're doing some gripping type of theater, People are giggling. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow. You know, so all of these things change. The, we are trying to change the culture for people to understand the level of work that entertainment is not always about the giggle, right? But of course, then you're trying to sell your show. <laughs> you want to get people into those seats and keep them there. So, the, you know, there's all of that. So when I heard Giselle talk about those things in terms of the costs, yeah, I, I know for sure, putting on a Broadway musical in, in Trinidad and Tobago, now, minimum, if you scrape, it's 200,000 you must start with. Must. If you want to put on a really good show, it's more than that, but 200,000. And that is if you keep the other part of it is the musicians. I'm a musician myself. I've had the opportunity to do a, a gifted an orchestra to do a, a musical. Nobody can do that again. You can only have up to um, about the basically 10 instrumentalists. And mm -hmm. ten instrumentalists, I can tell you, if you if they're good friends of yours, will cost you thirty thousand dollars. If you want quality music, <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. all of them. No, but I, I I would say, Marty, but you, I know you, I know you would say you're not part of it. You would say, well, why not just pre-record and get everything mm -hmm. done? But I no, can no, tell no. you that your if somebody forgets their lines or if. Um, from Giselle's side, she didn't make the call to fly in a certain part of the set and the recording is going, you are in trouble. And believe me, I have sat there as a conductor just rolling my hand like, keep vamping, keep vamping. I know mm -hmm. something is going on. Just keep vamping. You mm -hmm. can't look that. <laughs> Sorry. No, you can't. Yeah, no, no, so no, no. That experience it brings to it. So, so there are those costs. Um, but in the digital age, um, I, I think that we are, there is hope. We now have to reposition about how we are packaging everything by exactly what people are doing now. The live audience it is there, but packaging it for the digital experience. But that takes much higher production values, which I'm sure G Giselle will want to talk about because people think that you just come with cameras and film. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, because the camera crew, some of, we have to, you see, the thing is you have to educate so many people different people on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. So for example, a camera crew who's not accustomed to doing a stage production mm -hmm. would have to understand, you need to come in from the time it moves into the space so you can see the rehearsals and know where people, right. what they say, what they do, how things go. You can't just come the day before, throw up a camera and hit record. That, that's not how it works because then you're just, what's the point? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is the point? Because you're not doing any justice to the production when you do it like that. Right. So it's, everyone has to be educated into moving into these times and we have no choice because like at Napa, Napa in normal times was 11.60, people could come and sit. Um, now it's 3.50. Wow. wow. So, so you have to think, what can I do to get a live audience, a full live audience, but I also now have to incorporate a digital audience because mm. you really have no choice. Okay, so let me just take a little break there. So uh, uh, Mr. Arnold has just joined us. So let me just okay. bring, him in, bring him in. Um, John is the holder of a national award, Hummingbird Medal Gold for his work in culture. He has an immense experience working in culture, education, event management, and tourism. He's the music TT chair. He's a lecturer in event management. Um, and he's also a director on the creative TT board. So welcome John Arnold, everybody. Hi, good day, good day, everybody. Sorry for being late, but boy, I tell you, I don't understand this. Yeah, it's just part of life now. Yeah, you get, you're moving so in such a dynamic place. I have so many bosses that, uh, yeah. 
All right. I, yes, I'm, I'm here for a bit. Um, I actually ran out of a session um, to be here because I thought it was important, um, some of the things. I heard the last discussion from um, from Jessel and also Giselle, her last comments. So that, that's as much as I heard um, Jessel's last commentary um, with with the, the his um, experience and conducting and, and whatever, whatever the, I don't know what the original question was, but I'm just letting you know when I came in, yeah. <laughs> morning, John, good to see you. Good, morning, morning. Say good afternoon, sorry. Yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All of us touched on a point there, all of you, I should say, touch on a point there of the fairy godfather. And I, mm -hmm. I think the, the role of the private enterprise investing in music and theater is really, really important. Um, Pre-COVID, and I think it's even more important now, post-COVID, where the, the benefit of our audience reach is, is way greater now because of, we move into streaming and whatnot. Maybe, John, you could talk about that and um, how you I see mean, that playing in, into your ecosystem I, I think i think there are two types of corporate citizens i think those who understand the arts and want to be part of that and those who don't understand the arts and really don't care or it is a convenient time for them to make money they love the arts i think what we have to do is find those champions in the corporate world who understand the arts what was the value of the arts um the, the work that the arts is doing for the country um, completely. And I think once you have that, that happens. When you look at that production mass, uh, corporate citizen like FCB, um, you have somebody at the top who loves the arts, right? I mean, they understand that. And, and so his, his decision to support that will come very easily in terms of being as a as an arts person himself, so I think that the two kinds of um, corporate people, in my experience, I just during COVID I did a, a program called Grassroots for up and emerging artists in Tobago who had to submit, and I will tell you this: I didn't take a cent from the Tobago House of Assembly. The corporate citizens, about seven of them, supported the project because, again. You know, this PRN, which is Personal Relationship Network, I think everybody know that, PRN, um, that, that's a big thing, you know. Jessa has his PRN, Diesel has it, and once you get to use it, you know how to deal with which, which sponsors will champion, you know. So that, that's my take on that. Well, you actually mentioned the same thing about, and I must give credit, uh, I'm not trying to shout out anybody, um, but um, as you said, first citizens, and, and it's, it's, I've, I've experienced the same thing where um, there's a vested interest. In fact, right now, as we talked, as I had spoken earlier, what I'd spoken about was um, that we are working on Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival 2022, and they're one of the prime sponsors. And I have to tell you, there, there's an active role and there are discussions on the way to see how best that we can um, hold hands and of course you know, we, we are also looking as you have said we are looking for others in as you call it i like the term in the, in the PR, prm in that network who can also help to shape um what is happening um without anybody diluting each other's brands because you know that's a very important thing eh? this is a this is the sponsorship is a jealous thing and, and and people have to know that their brand is not going to be um, diluted um and they're not going to be competition because you know it's a shake hand thing Right. If if you were to sponsor something, people would like to know that they are getting their part of the recognition and they're able to show what they're doing community wise. We are, I'm very much aware of that. Um, so yeah, so we are continuing in that same way with the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival. That was one of the difficulties that I have with Must Come See Productions. Um, not everybody buying into the musical theater in the same way. Um, and that's something we we are still embarking as we go into the future. But that, of course, as, as Giselle is talking about, and all of the spaces which are so much now um, uh, uh, reduced, that's going to be, it's going to be a difficult sell because those are, those are top heavy um, productors in terms of finances. And we don't have, as Giselle said, the Broadway concept where we can run a show 
for three and four weeks and five weeks continuously. You know, we, we, we don't have a Broadway theater. We have theaters which house productions. We don't have the Broadway thing where uh, uh, a house and a place are the same, <laughs> the, you know? So um, I wish we can get to that concept because we have we have theaters where where you know more work can be done and and, and we have and we hopefully we're going to get to that that situation soon. So that's 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 my response to that and added comment on it. But a concern would be that the the there is a core group of corporate Trinidad who are mm -hmm. interested who do invest in in theater and music and creative arts. However. Everybody goes towards them because it's known. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And because mm -hmm. eventually those companies will, uh, you know, if the heads of those companies change and that next person is like, well, okay, we gave enough for the last 25 years. Right. And right. I you know I need to go somewhere else with, with this money. Yeah, yeah. Then we could be in trouble because uh -huh. the pool was so small, now the pool will get even smaller and we, so, Corporate as well needs to become mindful that that pool has to expand. And is it our responsibility to expand that pool? And if so, how? Because I that is a challenge for me. How do you get more corporate involved in understanding the arts? You know, <laughs> go ahead, John. I was going to say that that's an excellent question, Giselle. But um, one of the things I have found, and I can only talk from where I sit in several spaces, um, is this is something you have to apply consistency to. Um, and it also, I, I now have this new word champion. I find that you have to have two sets of champions. You have to find a political champion, right, who deals with the other levels of bureaucracy and acceptance and yeah, yeah. Mm. That's a whole story by itself. Mm. And then you have to come to the corporate side where you have to literally start to find friends who you can mm. share consistently. Because sometimes they don't matter with you in the first year. But you have to go again, you have to go again, you have to go again. That, 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 that has been my experience. And then once you do that first one, and they think they got it, and they can see where their own benefits accrue. I think that's where we get some buy-ins that that can last. Those relationships can last for a while. But um, Giselle is right. They do um, say. Um, I think everybody in the world goes around. Who are the the sponsors that do uh -huh. um, support? That's a fact. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just a shame that we, as an educator. Um, that people don't understand, for instance, within Trinidad and Tobago, we talk about the crime and we have all our papers and everything, and don't understand that a more peaceful society is one that is culturally aware and culturally secure. And people keep wondering, what are the police going to do? And what is Gary going to do? Gary's not a, Gary's not a cultural officer. Gary's role as to marshal people. When people go wrong, is to marshal them. Then they're the, they're the non garys whose role is to also assist those people to get back into society to become more aware. But then we now, as educators, are trying our best to show people that if you are, it's not, it used to be everybody ran after the sports, but again, sports is limited, that you culturally, and, and as Giselle pointed, boy, we are creative in every sphere to harness it and to move people into one, to give them a hope and to understand that there are not long-term, there are short-term benefits. It gets people more secure. It is its own site of, of psychology. If it's not just, of course, like we want corporate people to understand that because corporate people, one of the loudest who will say, my business is being affected. Well, we have the antidote. It's in the practice of culture. Believe it and be patient with it, just as how you have to be patient to grow your business. It is the same way you have to be patient to know we are providing this as, you know, in the cultural milieu. I, I'm tired of telling people that, yes, culture is expensive. It is. Make no mistake about it. it. It costs a lot to produce. But you know what? When you have the weddings and the funerals and any other person, who are you inviting? 
You're not inviting, with all due respect to your physician, the common appreciate. Who are you inviting to give that, that, that intangible that lifts? It is the cultural practitioner. And if you can think of that in its microcosm, think of that in the larger picture. In those countries, even let's say we look and we go just up the islands to Cuba, in all, in, in all of the, the poverty and, and the, the oppression from externally, is that culture has kept them alive and vibrant and informed. And that is the uh, Venezuela next door, where, which is under tremendous stress. Um, they yeah. have, they, yeah. They, yeah. everybody knows about the, the, the orchestral system, yeah. right? Yeah. Which has taken every, lots of people um, out, out of very dangerous situations. Yeah. Yeah. Just let people know, believe it, <laughs> you know. But yes, it's expensive. Then again, so is any investment, which is going to which is going to give you long term benefit. It is expensive, but you it's see, wonderful. You see, but you see, Jessa, uh, coming back, um, Martin, no, I say this all the time. The the issue is how how is how how is the creative sector perceived? And I always make this analogy. We are like the air freshener in your <laughs> bag. That's and, a new one. Yeah, That's I mean, if you if you want to, if the price, if you, the the bill is too high, and they ask you, well, you got to leave something out. The one thing you're going to leave out is the air freshener, because you kind of, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't need that. Yeah, that's that's almost a kind of perception of the arts that we. But it's funny. I recall when, when Nelson Mandela was coming, he had to do a surprise visit to Tobago. The first call that comes, um, John, we need your choir first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. You follow yeah. what I'm saying? Because it almost comes, we need that strong, something that, and that's the first thing that comes to your head. But I need them to think that way all the time, like how you yeah. say how we can transform and help build these communities and strengthen them and solve some of the crime problem, both sport and music and, and the arts, all the arts. Yeah. Play, play, everything. Yeah. Well, the famous, the famous soft power. I, I always tell people, look, when you are selling the country, you can sell lots of things, but exactly when you talk about your choir, I have, I have done um, chorale and steel or, or um, pairing from the University of the West Indies. We have done it everywhere. But I always remember when I toured with the National um, Steel Symphony Orchestra to Costa Rica. And we had to do a concert where the ambassador, the then ambassador invited all these other ambassadors. And I'll never forget the ambassador from Brazil alerted his people, come and give me a message about a halfway through this to say I have an urgent meeting to attend. That was his getaway. Yes, the ambassador told us to joke <laughs> after. You know, that, that's how you do it in diplomatic circles. Somebody runs up to you and, and then you have to tell your host, well, you know, I have an emergency. I'm not saying that's what you did this morning in your journey. Right? We, we, we cannot say. And National Steel opened up. At the end of the performance, the ambassador was there sipping drinks. Whoever came to talk to him, he just waved them away. That I, I always look at that. That is, and you know, so we're looking externally now. That's the power of culture. Yeah. And the, poor, the, the one of the other ambassadors told our then ambassador, he said, "How am I going to top this?" I'm not saying that because of the national steel, but of course I'm saying it because of steel and the power of steel and our culture externally. But then we also have to look at it internally, and 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 we, you know, we have to go past the, the sort of seasonal things. And I must say, Pantry and Bago under their, their new management has been doing a, a much better job of, of, of selling steel in all of its aspects. Right? Yeah. I was really um I, I must say your your um Tobago comrade, when I saw her doing something where on, on, you know, this was a spot of brilliance, time, culture, and other things. Imagine that you have the ruins of what's supposed to be Pantron Bago headquarters. And there she says, you know what? We're going to put crops here. Yeah. And I thought it was a brilliant yeah, yeah. Uh, not part of agriculture, but of course it helped to position culture in a different type of spot. Like I said, this is a piece of brilliance. And we, of course, are going to need to do that as well because we sometimes fall down when we are trying to sell our product as culture, venture capitalists, 
we don't actually always sell our, our culture in the same way. We and and of course we expect people. That's another thing. We expect people to understand, but you said it earlier, John, and I think Giselle, you touched on it. We need to educate. We need to put it in front of people. You need and you should embrace this. And let me tell you why. <laughs> but, but are we using the right words in, in telling them why? Because um, sometimes the 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 passion of of, of creative people cannot the language cannot transcend to the corporate air. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they think, oh, these the people and these musicians, and they're so passionate, and they're so this, and they think, and they did it right. But what is the dollars and cents? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes you need you need a a, a corporate person on your. That's on your, no, that's absolutely correct. Right? You need an ally. Looking for you to them, mm -hmm. so they talk you know, money to money talks, but they're representing the creativity. Yeah, because yeah. it gets lost. Yeah, you know. And and I have to tell you that, you know, in all of the places I've done, it's not always the dollars and cents don't always flow. Must Come See Productions very quickly um, became a not-for-profit not organization. Um, I'm very happy to say that the music festival, Trinidad Tobago Music Festival Association, has just become a non-profit after all these years. Because we have, because, and part of our thing too is imagine that we have a grant waiting from an unknown source outside, from an anonymous donor. And I filled out the entire grant application. And then they said, where your bona fides as a company, and it had to stop right there. Now we can go ahead and access it. And I think we want to also get our all our persons. You must set up structure. Boy, I, I look at a place. There's a woman from Trinidad Tobago, Lorna Green. She's a Trinidad native. She's now in Maryland, and she set up something called Cafe. Um, forgotten what Cafe, what the acronym is for, but it's an after-school program for music. And I think if it's not 30 years, she's celebrating 20 or 30 years. The first thing she set up, because she's in America, she set up the structure of the place. And it has endured. And we want to start saying to people, you exactly, just, I'm, I'm piggybacking, you must develop some sort of governance structure that allows people to do that. And I, one of the places that can help you, and John and I sit on that board, is the, um, the artist registry. The National Register of of, of, um, of of artists and cultural workers we want to say to people, you can get help from there, because you need to get your bona fides in order, and then you can get paperwork. And especially now that you're moving into this digital space where you want recognition, you've got to walk in with your ducks in an order. So, Giselle, I, I am endorsing and just adding to where people can go and look for these things. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> Right, we 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 really just cannot be doing the the cap in hand, and also we have to be able to convince people. It's not we don't want your support for this year, we want it for the next four to five years. Yes. So let's how can you help us develop that? Yeah, that that's what we're about. So I I certainly want, I hope that people are, who are there are hearing this. If you want your structure to have longevity. Yes, Giselle, and you have just you are the the gospel according to Giselle. You have got to ensure that you are speaking the corporate language. Otherwise, you're in a tower of Babel and nothing is going to happen. Sorry to mix my religious things here. All of it is what's today? Today's a Thursday. <laughs> yeah. No, no, John, you have uh, I wonder we're keeping you back. So whenever you have to leave, let me know. So We'll oh, keep no, you back no, 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 yeah, I, I, they're, they're calling me um, outside. Folks, I, I'm dealing with a little emergency. No need for All details. Right. But, yeah. Um, yeah, just have a... So I don't know if there was any... Um, I'm, I'm sorry I missed those opening comments from Giselle and um, Jessa. Um, I know I know. In the, in the talk, you were talking about um, what are some of the trends and some of the challenges we have had mm -hmm. as artists and so on. Um, I, I I just wanted to say that I mean everybody knows that the hardest hit has been the creatives all yes. everybody and and more so in in I mean Jason and my case and I'm sure Jesus those of us who run choirs and so on oh. would know that we have had <laughs> the biggest hit because our area was one of those that was easy to spread the um mm -hmm. spread the thing by the nature of what we do. Yes. So um, I lost a whole tour of three cities last year, um, and, and, and that was really heartrending. Um, they have now moved it to 2022, 
I hope that it can That's happen. A hope. Yeah. But I'm, it's a hope because right now it doesn't look, it, Carnival doesn't even look possible 2022 right now mm -hmm. from where I sit. But mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think that even in the challenges, I think we were able to see some glorious opportunities right. and some of us took advantage. And I think going forward, there are going to be many more opportunities that we have to maximize as creatives with what I call the um, the post-COVID post benefits for me, because there are some things we can play with and there are some things that we can now continue. Uh, sorry, I have to use the mass as an example because it is the most recent in my head, but I can see that continuing instead of just wine, jam, um, fet, that we now have some kind of theatrical productions that speak to carnival, Mm -hmm. that take place during Carnival. And something that maybe can travel, something that can move, something that can become, you know, something that we can go somewhere with, you know? So I think all those are possibilities. But those are my, sorry, I have to, <laughs> I don't have enough time to expound, right? Well, John just talked about something there that happened to me as well in 2020. The UE Arts Chorale was celebrating a 20th anniversary, and what did we come up with? One of our members came up with a superb idea. Let's go on a cruise and perform both on the ship and in four oh, countries. Yeah. And as we paid, boom, the yeah, orders yeah. closed. Wow. And I've never been on a cruise. Perhaps all of you all here, you all look like cruise people. I yeah, haven't been. No, so I, I was just <laughs> saying, this is my time. Let me get my beach towels, hit the gym. I need to look good. Huh? I ain't bother with the gym again because we lost we lost that, that opportunity. This was, this was our 20th anniversary special. And of course, John spoke about it. One of the first things that was affected is choral music. Two anecdotes. One, of course, was the, uh, the infamous one in, in Washington State, where one choral person managed to infect an entire group of 45, 50 persons, yeah. including that's as one of them. The other thing that, um, you, you know, that, that the other anecdote is something that I saw the other day, which is the, it's um, not the most scientific, but it spoke about the rule of language. They compared, it was a Japanese thing where they compared Japanese language, Italian and German, and of course, English and German have the same type of sort of consonants and explosions. And they discovered that German had the highest amount of of the of, of the virus exploded into a space and it's the same thing with um, our english speaking because what do we as singers do we tell people explode your consonants and therefore we have we have been shot down one of the things i i don't know if john is uh, familiar with and here's where i'm looking into the the, the quote-unquote future um for choirs um there was a i had my class um, recruit something the other day something which is called jack trip which is a type of technology which allows choirs to work together in real time online. Because right now, mm -hmm. current technology and everything else, and when you have to have good bandwidth, the, 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 um, the hardware is expensive, but we hope that more developments like these in the shorter term will allow choirs. And I, of course, I myself, I'm a choral person, um, um, instrumental too, but choral will allow all of the choirs around Trinidad and Tobago to start getting themselves together rather than having to do the take a track, take a click track, that get put everything together and then get somebody to, as you would know, Martin, to put all of that together, which is a headache. <laughs> I, I have never done it and I don't want the headache. <laughs> In fact, our chorale just did um, um, some gospel tracks along with um, somebody in January, and they're, they're still mastering it. So that there's, there are those types of things which are currently being done, but I myself want to hope that we can get into some sort of controlled environment where our choirs, and, and of course, Trinidad and Tobago has some of the best choirs in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that because I have UE Arts chorale, of which I'm very proud, but our, establ our established community choirs, of course, um, John has a Signal Hill, um, the Marinettes and the Lydians and the Southerners and the Love Movements, I'm famil familiar with all of them, are some of the best performing choirs, not just in the region, but in the world. And we know this from our music festival where every of the foreign adjudicators who used to come in, they used to just stand back and say, wow, look at this. So that's a product that we have to get together to be able to sell 
to sell internally because I know that a lot of people do enjoy coral performances as well as externally. And I'm glad that John um, touched on that because that is something which we are earnestly trying to deal with. And I refuse to say post-COVID. I'm saying the present and co-COVID because it's here to stay. Um, how we manage it is going to be up to us. So I'm hoping that we can get back to that along with, of course, what Giselle will speak about, about theater, but I'm hoping that our choral side can come in. Sadly, I hope I'm not sounding like a hypocrite, one of the biggest debates right now with the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival for 2022 is that we have excluded, at the moment, all of the choral classes because the, the distancing and the amount of virus that could be coming, is it is not possible to contain it. Now, with, when the vaccine comes, when the vaccine is evaluated, that may change. But right now, that's a hot debate. But as the chair um, and the executive, we have taken a position that is not something that we can, can contemplate given the current science, which is a pity because it's a part of what we do within Trinidad and Tobago. But there's the science. Giselle, I don't know what your thoughts would be. Um, no, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. COVID is it's tricky, I think, because as time goes by and people get more relaxed, um, some of you tend to forget it's there. Mm. So you find yourself um, planning things for groups. And because there's a familiarity with the people, you will tell yourself, well, I know what I'm doing. I know what you're doing. So we can gather. We can do things. We can still do things. But it's the COVID is still hovering there. So we and so I, I like the fact that you said you had to cut out chorals because that's a group that have to be close because the voices can't be separated all over the place. Um, so in terms of any kind of performance, whether it be a band or a group of actors, musicians, whatever it is, right now we're at the stage where you have to have in front of your mind how big a group of people is safe to have in a space and what is the group doing so like we all know band members have to wear masks or shields once you're a vocalist obviously that has to go because you need to hold your mic and sing and stuff like that so now you have to set your things your performers i can be this close to you you can, can be that far away from me, but we still have to get the impact of the performance. Performances that used to be before where we have to be close up on each other, whether you're acting or singing or dancing, you now have to have that space, but still maintain the impact of the performance. So it's, it's now become a little trickier. It's not impossible, but I think we have to keep it in our minds that, that um, COVID is here. We have to even just in rehearsals. Um, I gone to the group of performers recently, and I knew for a fact that they were not rehearsing with masks because mm -hmm. when they came into the space, it became an issue. <laughs> when we said to them, "You have to wear your mask," and they were like, "Oh, we couldn't breathe and things." But you know, when you look at shows on TV, because that informs us a lot. You know, foreign shows inform what what is going on, and I see dancers with masks doing full out routines and I'm thinking we just have to discipline ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't you know maintain that that I don't want to say a third world, but we can't maintain a backwards thinking of I can't wear a mask because I'm a dancer. And I, no, if we if they can do it at that level of the Grammys and whatever else they're doing it at, mm -hmm. come on, we can do it as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just ensure everybody's safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I go ahead. Go ahead. So yeah. Um, so I think the idea that um, yeah. So as you say, we have to do these things. We separate and distance. You were mentioning before you, the audience at the theater has dropped. What yeah. 80 percent, right? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. But it, they said fifty. But when you like at Napa, you have to leave. Of you skip the rows. Right. And you have to have at least two seats in between. So you can have small groups of people. You can have a group of four mm -hmm. because they would have come in the same car. So there's a familiarity there so you can sit together. But then you have to have two seats and then the next set of people, and then the row behind you is empty. So then that's how you end up with 
going from 1,600 people to 350 people. Right. Hmm. Yeah, so just the fact that, yes, our live attended audiences may have reduced, and we're still looking for the buy-in from corporate Trinidad, but we do have now the opportunity, since everybody is moving to a streaming-style event or hybrid-style event, we have the opportunity for a much larger audience and a yes. possible better buy-in for the corporate sponsors. You know, is this something that you think uh, needs to be marketed more, or do you all think it's being done enough? Because to me, if I'm a corporate person, a corporate sponsor, I'm seeing before I was getting at maximum 1,200 people uh, for a performance, but now I have the opportunity, um, theoretically, for millions of people to see my brand up on stage. Um, I would see that as a, I would probably prefer to spend more money, you know? So I, I don't know, do you, do you see that happening at all? It's, because I, I don't see it happening, you know? The challenge is still there because it was a challenge. The new challenge meets the old challenge. The old challenge was to get them interested in the arts. And now, so that challenge is now meeting the new challenge of less audience, less live audience. So now you have to sort of rework your argument, so to speak, uh, or your, your, your convincing of that, yes, this, this is where we are now. However, bless you, like you said, the possibility of a wider audience is is there. So now how do you get involved and what do you have to do to get involved? Because technology now is also another thing because everybody did not have access to cameras and the equipment that is needed to now stream. Right. So now you have to fit that into your budget. Yes. And so that, yeah. That, yeah, that's, yeah, that's now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's got to be. Hybrid, yeah. mm -hmm. So it's yeah. now, um, so I have to get this equipment to get you to sponsor me to be able to get the, my product mm -hmm. out. So now you probably have to go to somebody who can give you that. So it, it's always a challenge somewhere. Um, it's just to sit down and, and structure it out and, and understand apart from just the normal production expenses and production values that you want to aim for, there's also a new thing of digital equipment. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a young uh, to, to compliment. I, I would like to draw on the things that let's say students. Um, there's a young company called Chandelier Productions, um, run by a young enterprising. She she sings with the chorale, but she's on her own, Tiana Chandler, and she has been doing the platform all of the shows that she runs, including one which is um, going up um, tomorrow evening. All of the shows that they do are for live, but they're also for, they are pre-taped for packaging for the digital, or digital um, economy. And she has made her name in doing that because she's also, she works, she's actually, she knows tech very well. So she's able to bring her technical knowledge and the set of people together. And she's one of the persons who's sort of already in, in, in and I mean, it's a small company, but leading the way in terms of everything is digital ready, small audience and digital ready. So she's a person who's now in a, in a position on Chandelier to go and say to, to her corporate people, this is what I'm offering you. Which side of it would you like to be represented? Or would you like to be represented on both? And I believe this is the future. You, there, there, there's no question about this. this. Sorry, not the future. This is the present. Right. Yes. So and I think that the more that people can embrace and that sort of thing, and of course, it's always the young, because I myself, when I start to get back into my own work with choir, which I'm hoping will be September, I also now have to start thinking like that. What is the look? Because before there was a look, but you just simply had people come with two cameras and you humbly edited. Now it's different. It has to be staged properly. It now has to be properly managed. And people like the people who let your call colleagues, your stage managers now will be getting more work because they have to stage manage these professionally. And then we get the product both live and we get the product digitally. I think everybody has to operate in that space now. And that's how the corporates, I think, can and will be interested. Yeah. yeah. And I think also the, the proper use of social media is important. Yes, yes. Because there's, there's a lot of bacchanal on social media. Oh. <laughs> right? But we have to step aside from oh. the bacchanal side of it and, and use it for, for good. Yes. So 
Um, and in, in, in how do we use it to lift the values of what we're doing creatively? Yes, 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 yeah. Well, That's how that. I think Understood. social media was made for Trinidad and Tobago, you know, when, when those people started creating, they said, you know, I, I know that those two small islands just off South America, uh, this would be perfect for them. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, to, but so now we have to put it on the other side of Bacchanal after the A and the B for Bacchanal, the C for creativity. Let's get in and go for the D, which is the dollar. Sorry, I don't know where that came out from, but that, that's the way it is. <laughs> At the ABCD of where we are. Yes. Yeah. So, um, in your opinions, then, um, so the presentation is evolving for, for the creative mm. sector, right? So, with, yes. um, do you think there's need for adjustment in the content being presented as well? Because if if the audience is not buying in as much, is there something we can do to the content itself to make to get a larger audience to buy in to the say the choral performances and the um, musical theatre? You know? Well, huh. now that's, I know, go ahead, Giselle. I, I know what I'm going to say. I, I, I was actually going to send it to you because I think that's an interesting and tricky question because I'm not sure. Because it makes you think what is wrong with the content now mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, needs mm -hmm. to change. And I'm not sure how to answer that, honestly. That's a difficult one because it cuts across every, every, conception slash misconception all right so look at me i'm a black man i love classical and i deal heavily in classical music and musical theater not always associated initially especially when you when you think in terms of classical music all right um they're saying that is a thing then we have we, earlier we talked about um i think john may have talked about it let's talk about carnival product university of the west this produces something called the oleard now, do we want to manipulate the oleard so that its authenticity is lost so it can be packaged um, for a wider audience? Or do we find a way to keep the authenticity of it and to have it broadcast? Because the same thing in, the, in, in one of the packaging, that's one of the big things in, in um, the mass <clears throat> is about the matter of authenticity. What's quote unquote authentic mass? And therefore, what part of the mass do we want the public to see or the international public to see? That's an open question. I, I have no, I'm not even trying to think that there's an answer. But I think Giselle's um, response is, is, is best, which is what's happening with our current product. If we have a product and we believe in it and we love it, then we have to find a way to monetize it and to sell it without diluting it and saying, well, you know, you need to do this. Because, I, you know, I look at sometimes with soca, um, um, some, some soca is wonderful and some is not. But then you have sometimes the soca, which tends to make it internationally, has to be repackaged by European and American audiences. The beat changes utterly. It becomes a kind of a soggy soca in order to sell it. And is that the way that we want to do it? Because certainly reggae has not had always to do that. You get the authentic product and it goes. Why are we um, rum and coca cola our our our, our, our soca in order to get it out there? So it, it's, a, it's a wonderful question without a definitive answer um, because it's always going to be about what is authentic, what is inauthentic, what is commercial, how do we sell authentic, how do we, sell, how do we make it commercial without diluting, at which point do we uh, make it quote-unquote acceptable, such as too commercially viable. And we could go down putting more and more questions with flashes and... Then again, in the end, it, 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 it comes down to what the market will be. You know, it, it really comes down to that. But if we, though, the one thing I'll close off by saying, if we're only thinking about what the market will be and we don't have a clear compass for our cultural aspects, I think we are dead. Mm -hmm. We will get shown up over time because we are then going to be working towards, towards zero. We must have a core of what we believe in, what we're prepared to um, present, what we're prepared to tough out until, as you have stated before, until it catches on. That that would be my final statement on it. Anything to add, Giselle, on that? No, I, I think that that says it. That that says it. <laughs> I share that completely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just see if anyone has any questions in the chat. Um, I think we covered a lot of a lot of really really interesting topics. Oh, I hope every, everybody really benefited from this discussion. 
Um, I think so too. I, you know, for those who tuned in, I'm so glad to be able to see Giselle and John. That's John is right. the same committee. We never see Giselle, as I said, off camera. I don't know when the last time we see Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. supposed to take each other these days, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know if anybody has questions. Well, if they do, we probably can't answer them. But <laughs> we <really do. laughs> um, I'm not really seeing any questions here. Everybody's just been commenting on how great the discussion is, and um, laughing at all the uh, the great commentary that you have. <laughs> the the, so the Glenda Collins comments and the soggy soca line. That's he put it on coming. Hi, Glenda. <laughs> Glenda would like that. That's a type of humor. <laughs> yeah. So, God, this will be calling you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm contactable, but I'll say what I'll say to them. Some of yeah. them, have, you know, I've studied at university. Some have studied with me. I have no problem with that. Hey, this is this. The art is a, is a place for blows, yeah? Because that's what makes you better. <laughs> if you can't take blows, hey, you're Oops, not supposed yeah, to be here. Mm -hmm. Work in a bank. Yeah, mm -hmm. but even my bank these days, hmm, don't go in the phone teller line at all. <laughs> I'm sure that's a line nobody. So I don't want to work that line today. Oh, there's nothing to get. <laughs> yeah, don't matter where you are. Yeah, there's there's good. But in culture, um, we are working in a public space. Even if, if Giselle, even if you're working backstage, if you're working yeah. front, we work yeah. in a public space, and therefore our work is rigorous, uh, rigorously examined as it yeah. should be. Yes. And um, I, I mean, I have had people criticize me for doing musical theater. How dare you? Why don't you do local music theater? I've had it leveled at me many times. And I've had responses, which have been some polite and some not so polite, because that's my nature. I, I'll be, I, I will defend what, um, what I'm doing and what the people who believe in, in the product are doing. Um, classical music on pan. I have done that quite a lot, and people not it's not always been to everybody's taste. And again, I'm able to defend it by saying, this is what I am doing. Whatever you are doing, I'm not going to take it down, but this is what I'm going to be doing here. So my thing is, whatever product, so for instance, when I took over the National Seal Symphony Orchestra, we did every style of music, and yet people chose to focus only on why are they doing so much classical? And I said, well, everybody else is doing every other type of thing. My UE art steel, similar, similarly, yes, we do classical, but we do other things as well. It depends not only just on what the market can take in, but what I believe should be done to expand and make us unique and to stand out. The same thing, um, people say, why don't you music theater? Why don't you make everything local? No, why in Sound of Music, why should Maria, instead of having a guitar, why should Maria have a pan? I'm sorry, we don't do, we, uh, when you have a guitar, you can sit and play with people. You can't with a pan do do a dare and teach children in the same way. It doesn't work with the plot. There are things like this. So people have to understand that th they're defensible things and am I afraid of questions? And I think Giselle is the same way. We're not afraid of questions. When we're talking um, about the three things that brought us together, because we all worked on the production of Rent. Now, when Rent came out, why um, should the producers of that have to defend its content? Why? It was relevant. It was hard hitting. And that is why you go to theater to be entertained and to have things which are hard hitting. And what people don't realize is that Rent had its overt themes. Sound of Music is about Nazism. Oliver, which we did, has serious espousal, abusal um, issues inside of it. Fiddler on the Roof deals with ethnic cleansing right down to the end. These wonderful musicals all deal with some very harsh and oppressive issues um, with a sort of with what we have to call gossamer um, treatment of it. So when people come, so there are going to be criticisms, but that is the nature of art. And I have, I'm going to go one more on my soapbox because when recently one of our high officials criticized at Carrie Fester the singing of the national anthem and said there's only one way to sing the national anthem of Trinidad and Tobago, I just looked at Joe Biden, the president of the United States, their national anthem, which was sung by, what's her name, Lady Gaga, Mm -hmm. And as a musician, the National Anthem of the United States of America is in three time. One, two, three, one, two, three. Lady Gaga sang it in four. Yes, she mm -hmm. added a beat to each measure. I didn't see Joe Biden jump off the podium and pull off his mask and say, what are you doing? This is the nature of art. Stretch the boundaries. And it comes with a core belief in what we do. So these are just my, my, my thoughts here on that. That is interesting because is it is... Mm. 
we know we have issues with, with the anthem in Trinidad. Is, does it date back to some sort of like colonial mindset that we have brought forward with us to, to sort of like harness creativity? Sometimes you have people saying that you can't do this like this or you can't do this like that. And, but there's no rule or written anything that said, I can't. Exactly. Why are you putting your rules on me? Yeah. I'm well, expressing myself in my way. You can yeah. express yourself in your way. Absolutely. And in Carrie Faster, it's more creative. Yes. Right? And if you went to a show and you didn't like the music or how the singer sang, then you're free to leave. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And say, no, well, no. Okay, now I know what you do and I don't think I want to come back anymore to what you do because I don't right. like it. And right. that's my choice. But it's also my choice to present it. But you know, and our anthem, because we are creative people, our anthem has three sets of errors in it that we have adopted and that people don't even recognize. Or the fanfare at the very beginning is always, the rhythms are always misplayed. And then side by side we stand is always missed some because we sing side by side we stand, by the ta, uh, 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 which is incorrect, that's the incorrect rhythm. And then the big splash at the end, uh, I'm here every creed and raise find an equal place. I may God uh, bless on the find equal place. You know that how they elongate place? That's not in the score. That's us as a creative people saying we like that and we want to stretch it out. But that's not there. So again, that shows us that despite, as you said, colonialism, we have actually done our creativity with our own anthem and it has become enshrined and it sounds natural it just happens to be from a musician's point of view wrong musician <laughs> okay let's take on that so if the person who pakistani wrote the anthem mm -hmm. and gave it to trinidad yes and that was it so yeah. if he put it a certain way and if the music scores a certain way mm -hmm. It's, I guess it's safe to say nobody ever argued and said, no, you all are singing it wrong. No, that's not how it is. No. Mm -hmm. So now we have reached to 2021 where those three things have changed. And I thought that was natural. But now that like you point it out, I'm like, oh, well, but does that make it right or wrong? No. We now that start, with, hey, those three things need to fix and go back to what it was originally. Or just let it be. In fact, well, I, I am I'm a miserable musician. I always smile because I refuse when I conduct either orchestra or steel pan orchestra, I refuse to let that part slow down. I go straight through it. So the audience is like, what is this? He just <laughs> he deprived us of our moment to hold. And I'm yes. saying, sorry, I'm going with the score. You don't like it? Sorry, too bad. <laughs> you know, that's my level. So I am actually being an anti-creative. I am going with the authentic score <laughs> and then shocking people by... But what how, what could what you doing to us? Yes, because so, now you're being the front. Actually, you're like you know, Justin Marie went and changed the anthem. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So these these are the things that where when we try to put this judgment based on us as creat creative, get on solid ground before you start making the pronouncements. But we would prefer if you say in this context we're going to do it this way, and in that context we're going to do it that way. Right? These are this like many times in our anthem, people don't like to end uh, and, and may God bless our nation. No, I may God bless our nation. They want to go up and make it heroic. What's wrong with that? That's not on the score, but it sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> and this is because we are creative people. And the anthem, which by the way, if unless history is proven wrong, wasn't written for Trinidad and Tobago. I believe it was written originally for the Federation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and then it became for Trinidad and Tobago after the, you know, um, um, you know. So, um, so when, so when we think of the various iterations of where the anthem um, was and now is, when all of these things add into us about about authenticity, about creativity. The one thing I would not like to see, I mean, but then again, I'm almost, I was just, I almost did a lie, and I'll tell you why. I'm now saying I wouldn't like to see our anthem being recorded for commercial gain, but. I am a lion that because the national anthem of South Africa, Nikosi Sikeleli Africa, is so beautiful. I have used that anthem in many concerts as a concert piece over and over. <laughs> yeah, it's so beautiful with choir and steel, choir and orchestra. I just love the work. And do you think to do that? Yeah. I'm sorry? Do you have permission to do that? Or an anthem is available? An anthem is an anthem. 
Right. I've done it in the United States. I've done it here, and I have to tell you, the South Africans they normally stand up with a salute, especially when when um a Mandela was still in in jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know it really. So it's about the use of it because at one time that anthem was banned. So it's it's actually a statement of revolutionary intent. Right. But and then by the way, I have been to South Africa, and what's this song that you hear street groups singing as part of their presentation? Is Nikosi Sikeleli. They sing it as street fair. Mm. <laughs> Imagine that happening in Trinidad and Tobago as part of our own culture, singing a national anthem as street fair because we have a beautiful anthem. Love it. Yes. Anthem. Instead of keeping it in this cocoon of conservatism, let's open it up and say, let's have the audiences everywhere hear it and celebrate it. That's another part of creativity. Yeah. Now, some may disagree, but then again, as I told you, I, I love argument. That's why we're here. <laughs> All right. So that seems like a nice place for, for us to wrap up. Um, okay. We were trying to keep this to one hour, but we were already an hour and 15 minutes in. So. Oh, my goodness. We apologize. No, no, no. This, this no? is a great, great, great. <laughs> um, I want to thank. Um, Jessel Murray, Giselle Langton, and John, who had to leave earlier. Yeah. This was a great, great discussion. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you all, um, they can probably, we can share their your um, social tags or um, yes. emails in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm easy. There's yeah. Google call. They can email. They can things. I have other endeavors. I, I, I'm easy to contact. I, right. I'm like the Pune market. I'm right there. <laughs> right so again thank you all very much um we hope to have more discussions like this in the future i think this was one of the best i really enjoyed it so thanks so much thank Most you this was lovely it was lovely to reconnect Most. it's been too yes. long yes. yes okay all right, all right. thank so you thanks bye everyone all right bye bye, bye.